Fine. All right. So we're here at the Triangle Bitcoin and Business Meetup, and we're honored to have Jimmy Song, a developer at Paxos, who I believe also worked for Armory and has done a number of different things in the Bitcoin ecosystem. But I would say one of the, the things I really like about Jimmy is how proactive he is about education, especially for developers and for those who are really looking at uh, contributing to the Bitcoin protocol itself, because this is an incredibly challenging uh, piece of software to work on. It, the, the really closest thing that I can liken it to is some sort of like aerospace engineering. You know, you really have to get things 100% perfectly right because if there's a single problem that is in your code that goes out into production, it's very hard to revert or roll back or undo uh, any terrible calamities that happen. So speaking of terrible calamities, uh, we're going to be talking about Bitcoin and how well it has weathered all of these different calamities over the past nine years. And this, uh, this meme of the honey badger of, of money that has come to pass of, of all of the skeptics over the years who have claimed that you know, Bitcoin is going to die or crash or get crushed by something. And yet, even though it does have its, its downturns and its troughs of disillusionment, somehow it keeps coming back. And it, it seems to get stronger and, and better every year. So there, there are a number of different reasons for this. And I think Jimmy is going to touch on a few of them. So Jimmy, if you're ready, please uh, take it away. Well, thank you, Jameson, for that very uh, gracious introduction. And uh, thank you to everybody that's showing up in Rally. Unfortunately, I don't have sort of a uh, line of sight to the audience or anything like that, but I can sort of hear you. So I, I hope, hopefully that's good enough. Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to talk today about the uh, th three different anti-fragilities of Bitcoin. And, uh, and hopefully you guys can see my slides and everything. Uh, but essentially, uh, this is something that we all sort of know, uh, but, you know, like, don't have a really good explanation for. Um, and the two two sort of anti-fragile uh, instances of Bitcoin can be sort of summed up in these two instances. The first is the Silk Road, right? Like the, this was uh, something that happened in 2013 when it got shut down. Um, it was sort of uh, seen as the main use case for Bitcoin, and you know, uh, and you know that that was thought to essentially destroy Bitcoin. Um, and the other one is happened earlier this year, and that's Bitcoin Cash. And obviously that was a hard fork and uh, the network uh, slowed to a crawl for a little bit and things like that. But anyway, let's let's talk about Silk Road, first of, uh, first of all. Um, so th this was a big deal back in 2013. I don't know how many of you were around back then, uh, but it, it happened around the summer of 2013. Um, Ross Ulbricht was arrested. Uh, Bitcoin was around uh, about $100. It did fairly quickly to about 80 and then it shot right back up. And we had one of the best bull markets in Bitcoin ever. Like it went from something like $100 to, you know, a peak of 1100 late 2013. Of course, those numbers seem quaint now, now that we're at 11,800. But at the time, that was, uh, that was a really big deal. The other uh, uh, sort of disordering event uh, that, that's happened over the past few years is, uh, is the Bitcoin cash fork that happened on August 1st. Uh, that was thought to be uh, this really big deal. Um, you know, it was going to sort of split the network in two. Hashing power was going to be split. And there was going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of different things that, were, that people were fearing uh, before the hard fork. Uh, of course, uh, you know, nothing that drastic happened. Um, you know, price was at 2700 before, and we've been on a bull run ever since. Uh, we're currently sitting at 11800 So uh, something is going on here. And, and, and what I'm trying to uh, do with this talk is to figure out what's going on, right? We do, I, I, I think most people believe that Bitcoin is anti-fragile. That is, whenever there are disordering events or something that sort of disrupts the entire system, something happens to Bitcoin and it seems to get stronger and like the price seems to go up, there seems to be more engagement, more people. Um, so this talk is really about exploring what happens 
uh, whenever there's a disordering event. And uh, I'm going to try to frame it in sort of three different uh, spheres of, of Bitcoin in general. And, uh, and that's, that's what we're going to talk about. So uh, the first thing that the first sort of area and probably the easiest to understand is the technological uh, anti-fragility of Bitcoin. And when I say technological, I mean sort of like, uh, you know, the, the code and the ecosystem around it. Um, and in order to talk about anti-fragility, you have to talk about sort of disordering events and how they end up cre uh, creating more value for Bitcoin as a result of those. So let's take a look at some of the ways in which we have technical disorder. Uh, so traditionally, whenever you have anything technical, you have you have a few sort of technical attacks that that end up happening. First are sort of like protocol level. Um, you can think of this uh, if you if you have a company or something like that. Uh, and you, you're a software company, th this would be like bugs in your code or something like that. The second are uh, sort of what you would call like denial of service attacks. If you if you run a website, if you're Facebook or something, you know, somebody like massively DDoSes your, uh, your, your servers, that, that would be what a, uh, this category of disorder would be. Um, third would be sort of like different technologies, maybe alternatives to the technology that you are presenting. And they, they constantly come up, right? And, and uh, that, that can be a disordering event as well. And, and the key thing about all of these is that, uh, at least in Bitcoin, we have very few guarantees. There's no, uh, nobody sort of saying, okay, well, we can have downtime um, and, you know, we'll go fix this stuff. There's, uh, there's no government backing you up or uh, you know, sort of like choosing, picking and choosing, uh, you know, what you're, you are or are not allowed to do. And, uh, and these are things that any technology faces. And in Bitcoin, uh, we, we gain from these things, believe it or not. Any, anytime something happen, any of these things happen, uh, we, we gain technologically. So let's, let's see some ways in which we gain from, uh, technological disorder. So, we, we have had protocol level attacks. Um, I think since around 2013, we've had transaction malleability. Uh, this was famously quote, uh, cited by Mark Carpellis during the peak of Mt. Gox as the reason why he couldn't uh, you know, give people back their Bitcoins was his transactions were being you know, changed in some way and that caused his accounting systems to think that uh, you know, he, he had not sent out Bitcoins when he had and things like that. Uh, but, you know, the, the actual malleability attacks on the network actually led to strength, uh, a strengthening of the network. That is, Bitcoin, uh, you know, upgraded essentially with, uh, with stuff like SegWit, which removed that malleability and also fixed a whole host of other things uh, it, on top of the malleability fixes. Um, we also have our own form of denial of service, and that would be something like transaction spam. Um, and that's that's been going on for a while, at least according to Luke Dash Jr. Um, I don't know how real that is, but certainly there's a lot of transactions that have very low value uh, that are on the network constantly. Right now, uh, the mempool is filled with a bunch of transactions that do like one or two satoshi per byte, and they uh, nobody really knows where they came from, and there's a big a big bump of them. But you know that too is sort of an attack on the network, but it also makes us stronger because as a result of transaction spam, as a result of blocks getting full, as a result of a lot of people, you know, um, you know, trying to do things with the Bitcoin network that really wasn't meant to be, we we we've developed the second layer. We we've developed payment channels. We've developed Lightning Network. We've developed a lot of these things that are meant to address that. And not only are we addressing it, we're doing like a lot more than uh, what uh, just fixing this one problem. We're, we're making all, whole new use cases out of it. And that, that's a huge technical game. And third, um, you know, there, there have been several hard forks now. And, uh, and, you know, all of them sort of purport to be better software for whatever, uh, you know, use case that they imagine. Uh, but these hard forks actually end up making Bitcoin stronger because we have to deal with the hard forks, right? There are people like Jameson himself, right, like uh, that that have to go in and you know code and make sure that the hard forks don't disrupt their business. 
Um, and and that, there's a whole ecosystem of people that are that are changing things for the better as a result of these hard forks, and that that strengthens the Bitcoin network. And really, um, the, the fact that we have very few guarantees, they lead to a form of prudence. Uh, this, this is a virtue, right? Like we are much wiser about what we do because we know the problems that, are, that, that we may encounter. And that, that leads to wiser, more thoughtful decisions instead of sort of the rash decisions that you may be making if you didn't have many of these problems. And that's a very good thing. We, we gain as, uh, as a community as a result of these attacks and our response to the attacks. And really, when you think about technological anti-fragility, uh, you know, it, I, I used to like wonder about this a lot because I'm like, well, okay, I, I know Bitcoin's anti-fragile, but I've read the book uh, by Nassib Taleb and he says that, you know, anti-fragile things have an organic quality. Well, how does software have an organic quality? And I asked myself this question for a while, and then, and then the answer came to me. It's the developers. They are the organic component. Uh, that, they're the ones that give Bitcoin the technical, technological anti-fragility. Because if you think about it, you know, Bitcoin isn't Skynet. It's, it, it's, it doesn't sort of heal itself and like just adapt to whatever network conditions. It's actually kind of a dumb program. We, it, just tell, it, it does what the developers tell it to do. The fact that we have an ecosystem of developers is what gives it the technological anti-fragility. And not just core developers, but wallet developers, you know, merchant developers, exchange developers, everybody, all the developers in the ecosystem contribute to that anti-fragility by being forced to deal with a lot of these attacks that come through. And as a result, they make a, a better Bitcoin. And that that makes Bitcoin a better store of value, a better money. Uh, a better way to um, you know store your wealth, and that brings in more people, that brings in more uh, investors, and and of course that causes the price to go up. So, in many ways, this is uh, this is one of the major anti fragilities of Bitcoin, and perhaps the easiest to understand because we we know the mechanisms at work. People try to do different things to attack the network, and developers fix it, but not only fix the issue. But go way beyond that and, and, and make Bitcoin as a whole much, much better. All right. So we, we talked about technological anti-fragility. Uh, the next anti-fragility I want to talk about is economic anti-fragility. And by economic anti-fragility, I'm really talking about just sort of uh, Bitcoin as money, Bitcoin as a store of value and, and how that uh, you know, how price is affected and things like that. And, and we understand this a little bit less than the technological one, but I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to explain to you what's going on. So once again, if we're talking about economic anti-fragility, that means that it gains from disorder. So we have to think about what disordering events there are sort of from an economic perspective. So let's take a look at the different ways in which economic disorder happens on the Bitcoin network. So first one, a company collapses, right? Um, and th this happens all the time, but th this can be a disordering event for any sort of economy. Um, you know, if, if the largest uh, company in uh, some small country uh, collapse, you know, that would obviously affect that economy. Um, another sort of economic disorder that can happen is a, a government ban. Um, you know, this famously happened with prohibition in the United States where a lot, you know, just alcohol was banned. So all these alcohol businesses just sort of had, you know, that, that was a very disruptive event for them. Um, and, and finally, uh, the third one is um, irrational exuberance. And th this often happens when sort of the, the market gets, or uh, people's investment gets ahead of the actual uh, output of the said good. And, you know, this is what we would call like a bubble or whatever. And this this often happens when you know too many people are interested, but there's not enough sort of evidence of the thing being good. Um, and all of these things, again, very few guarantees, at least in Bitcoin. Um, and that's not to say that doesn't happen in other industries. For example, in banking, companies are almost not allowed to collapse, right? Too big to fail. And governments ban things that they don't like all the time. And there are lots of bubbles and governments try to keep that bubble up and things like that. And uh, all of these, all of those actions that the government does tend to fragilize the system. They they make uh, they make it more vulnerable 
to uh, other disordering events. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened with the housing bubble in 2008, which led to Bitcoin, obviously. Um, and that, that, that's, that's something to keep in mind. Anyway, these, these are all things that happen uh, with respect to Bitcoin as well. Let, let's see how we gain as a, uh, how, how there's economic gain in Bitcoin. If, if it truly is an anti-fragile, it should, uh, you know, Bitcoin should gain from this disorder. So let's take a look. All right, so economic gains. All right, so we companies die. And this is, this is a fact. And, you know, so many of the early Bitcoin companies uh, died due to hacks. We don't know if they were internal or external or if like people ran away with them. But, uh, you know, the poster child for we companies dying is Mt. Gox. Had that been like a normal U.S. bank or something, I'm sure there would have been a bailout and they would have just sort of persisted. But the fact that Mt. Gox died is actually a really good thing because, um, you know, that spurred a lot of other exchanges and people started, you know, using them, you know, uh, a lot of other exchanges that were a lot better at security. Mt. Gox was famously terrible at security and they they didn't, uh, you know, Mark Carpellis apparently held the keys to everything and, you know, um, he, he got hacked and all this other stuff. So the fact that we companies die is actually a gain for the system because, you know, th this is a company that really didn't deserve to exist. All right, second, uh, government bans, uh, you know, have happened. And uh, certainly China's apparently banned Bitcoin like 50 times. Uh, but that has sort of been a good thing for Bitcoin as well, because as a result of their many, many bans, what, what we've uh, come to as a community is that, well, you know what, like the first few times, you know, Bitcoin went down a drastic amount and then, uh, you know, slowly came back and then they banned it again and it come down just a little less and so on and so forth. The, the action that the government takes uh, has less and less effect. We're, we're getting immunized to the government banning, uh, if you will. And, and really, they're becoming less and less relevant as a result. And, and you know, China used to be a big economic player, uh, at least from a trading standpoint. Uh, but, you know, ever since China banned it, you know, the, everyone's sort of moved on. Um, and a lot of that money has moved uh, to other places or, or, or other investments. And, it, it, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, other countries have picked up the slack. It's, it, it doesn't matter that much anymore. And this sort of less dependence on a single country is a very good thing. That's, again, an economic gain. Um, and, you know, uh, there there have been a lot of bubbles in Bitcoin's hi history. And uh, many of you in the audience, I, I don't know how many of you have been around since like 2013 or whatever, but many of you may not have gone through an 80% correction. Uh, but that that's that's happened multiple times, right? And, and, and that's something that a lot of people have, you know, experienced and have gone through and they're, they're very familiar with, with what that's like. But in a way, that, that too is good. Having had a lot of uh, ups and downs, that causes a lot of people to be more convicted in, in what they're investing in. Uh, the we can shake out. The, the really convicted people stay. The true believers stay. And having a, a community that really believes in this stuff and really knows what's going on and is, is invested properly, well, they're the ones sort of uh, that have all the influence in the, in the, in the current climate. And that's a very good thing. We, we get used to this uncertainty. Um, and, and, you know, like a, a lot of us uh, old timers that have been, been in this for a while, you know, I, I, I'm sure it'll drop like 60% someday and we'll be like, well, you know, that's happened before. That's okay. And we're, we're all that much more steeled against that sort of, uh, you know, economic uncertainty. And that's okay. That, that makes the community stronger. And really, um, the, the few guarantees here uh, that we have, because that we're not backed by our government, because the government isn't sort of bailing out bad companies like Mt. Cox, and because, you know, the government tries to do things, but, you know, we find, find them irrelevant, that leads to the virtue of temperance. And temperance, um, I, I, I define as sort of being in that sweet spot between not being too lazy and not being too greedy. Because at both extremes, you're not very productive to society. 
if you are a very lazy person and you don't you don't take care of your wealth very well, if the government bails you out of that, well, then that you're you're sort of a net negative to that economy, and uh, and you you never really learn your lesson. On the other hand, if you're too much of a risk taker and the government bails you out, well, then you're you're just going to keep taking way too big a risk. Bitcoin punishes both extremes. If you if you didn't invest Bitcoin, right? If you didn't hold through the bubbles or whatever, um, uh, then then you know you're out. If you if you just sort of like want too much risk and go into ICOs or you know uh, you know all all kinds of like scammy things, um, you're also out. You, it, Bitcoin rewards the prudent, temperate investor, and that that's what we end up with as a result of these economic uh, disordering events. And really, uh, when you think about economic anti-fragility, you have to think, okay, well, what, what's the organic component here? And the organic component here are really the hodlers, right? The holders, uh, the people that, that hold through all of this stuff, that, uh, that believe in it, that, that hold their wealth in it, that, uh, that see Bitcoin for, what, uh, for the true thing that it is. And it, it's uh, a really good store of value. And they're the ones that give it the an economic anti-fragility. They're the ones that allow Bitcoin to survive all of these things that are disordering uh, and not only survive, but come back much stronger. Because when you have holders and you have more people coming in, well, you know, the weak companies have died. Now there's opportunity for more companies to come in. Well, you know, government bans it here. Well, then there's another jurisdiction that has an opportunity, uh, you know, as a result of the new holders or the people that want to come in. And, you know, like when bubbles happen, you know, they, they, they keep the people that really believed it and, and they're the ones that survive. That's a very good thing. This is, this is what gives Bitcoin the economic anti-fragility. All right, so we've talked about the technical, uh, technological, the economic uh, anti-fragility. Uh, now we're going to go on to the third one, and this is the social anti-fragility. And in many ways, this is probably the least understood of the anti-fragilities that Bitcoin has. And the reason I say that is because it's it's fairly easy to understand. Okay, well, there's a bug here, and you know, developer fixes it, and you know, that makes Bitcoin stronger. Okay, well, there was this price here. This company died, and you know that gets fixed. Well, that that um, you know, it's it's easy enough to see from a price perspective. The social, though, I would argue, is probably the most important, and probably the least understood. And uh, and you know, there are sort of social disordering events. So let's take a look at those and figure out how how they make Bitcoin uh, more anti fragile. All right, so. Social disordering events, and I, I will call the first one sort of like the FUD or the two, uh, or as us Bitcoiners call it, the tulip attack. Every technology, every new technology, um, or really anything new, gets a lot of FUD thrown around it. And if you don't know what FUD stands for, that's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, and and that happens uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but you know, people just don't like the unfamiliar. So, for example, when electricity first came on the scene. Uh, people were afraid of it, right? Uh, they were saying, okay, well, this is enough uh, power to kill an elephant or something like that. And, and they had these videos that showed that stuff and, uh, you know, made, made people afraid. When, uh, when microwaves were first introduced, uh, you know, people were saying, hey, you know what? This, it takes out all nutritional value from your food. You should never use a microwave. Um, and, you know, when cell phones first came out, people were saying, you know what, it's too close to your head. It's going to cause you to have cancer. Now, all of these things are things that we don't think about now because they're sort of a part of the society that we live in today. But that sort of FUD or sort of, uh, you know, saying, hey, you know, th this is this is bad and, you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't do it. Uh, that sort of attack is very common from a social perspective, and it's a socially disordering thing. And, you know, very famously in Bitcoin, you know, pretty much every, every economist that's uh, criticized Bitcoin has mentioned tulips at one point or another. Very interesting because, you know, it seems that they only really have one argument. It's that it fits this other pattern that we didn't like. All right. Second one is a governance takeover attack. And this happens a, a lot in sort of other social realms. Uh, often a movement will start and then politicians will sort of like front run it, you know, uh, what they call like 
getting in front of the parade and taking credit for being a part of that movement when really they, they're latecomers and they just wanted to speak for those people and get their votes or something like that. Uh, but that, that sort of thing happens quite often in sort of any social setting. And uh, you know, uh, this, this happens in particular a lot in politics where lobbyists will say, well, we, we represent all of these people when in fact, really they're just looking out for their own interests. Um, and you know, they, they often partner with government to sort of um, you know, uh, pass regulations that are really good for them and not the people that they purportedly represent. And that happens quite often. Um, and, that, and that too has happened in Bitcoin as well. And, and, and the third one is uh, oftentimes there are alternatives that come along that can also be disordering. And, and, and that happens all the time too, right? Like uh, there are new clubs or new associations or, or whatever uh, new things uh, come along and say, okay, we're better than such and such thing and, and therefore you should join us. And all of these things have happened to Bitcoin. And in the social sphere, there are, there, are, there are absolutely no guarantees. There are no guarantees, at least as far as Bitcoin is concerned. And, you know, we, we, we have to sort of withstand these attacks without any help from the outside world. And that, in a way, is a very good thing. So let's take a look at how Bitcoin gains as a result of these uh, disordering events. Oh, before I do that, um, this is sort of the attitude of everybody that sort of criticizes Bitcoin. I heard about Bitcoin. I'm here to fix it, and that happens quite a bit. Uh, and and this is this is sort of the attitude of the social disruptor: is is you know I am going to fix whatever is wrong with you, and you you can be much better. Anyway, let's take a look at the ways in which uh, we get social gains. All right, so. The first thing I want to point out is that people have criticized Bitcoin as a tulip bubble, uh, like since forever. And uh, Jamie Dimon is is just you know the late, latest in many. Uh, anyone remember like Professor Bitcoin, or you know uh, even older than that, the Wired magazine. You know Bitcoin is dead. This was in 2011 when it was like at two dollars or something like that. Uh, but, you know, the result of all of these attacks is that really the appeals to authority are no longer really, really listened to in the Bitcoin community. Nobody cares what, you know, Ben Bernanke says or, you know, Warren Buffett says or Jamie Dimon says, like, nobody really cares. You know, they, they, they are more uh, concerned with how the Bitcoin community is going and not about what other people outside Bitcoin are saying. And that is in itself a, a real strength and a gain from an anti-fragile perspective. Second, uh, the New York agreement showed that businesses are not in charge. And min in many ways, that whole Segwit2x New York agreement was an attempt, attempt to take over the governance of Bitcoin. And, uh, and normally that works when you have a sort of a government and business sort of like colluding to make it really good for businesses to like, make people consume more of their products or something like that. But in this case, you know, all, the community fought back and they didn't really have that voice before. And, uh, and that's kind of what the New York, the failure of the New York agreement showed is that the businesses are not in charge. Uh, you know, like Bitcoin does not owe any business their business model. Uh, if your business model no longer works, well, you're going to die. And, and there are going to be other businesses that are going to take over from you, all the, all the customers you might have. Uh, and, and that's kind of what the New York agreement shows. They, they, they wanted some other, uh, they wanted their current business models to uh, be least disrupted uh, in many ways. And that's, that's who the signers of the New York agreement were. It's mostly people that wanted to keep their business models, not have to code, uh, you know, difficult things. Um, and, and figure out, uh, you know, they, they just wanted a bigger block size so they can just keep doing whatever they were doing and they wanted their businesses to be protected. Well, this showed that, okay, you're not in charge. It's, it's really the community that gets to decide. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there are alternatives, right? There are, uh, you know, that's what altcoin stands for. It's an alternative coin. There are other sort of models, economic incentives and uh, you know, governance structures and all sorts of other ways in which you can do that. Um, and, you know, those things are good as well. Th those alternatives have sort of, well, not only made Bitcoin step up its game, 
But also, like a lot of the greed and scams that were in Bitcoin have left for the more cleaner pastors of altcoins and ICOs and things like that. See, back in like 2012, 2011, like a lot of the scams were actually in Bitcoin. But because altcoins and you know ICOs and things of that nature uh, have appeared, all of those greedy and scammy people have more or less left. Not to say that you know Bitcoin is free of scams now, but a lot of those people have left because you know they they have a much greener pasture. And in many ways, the social community around Bitcoin is saying, you know what, don't don't come here. You know, if you want to do any of that stuff, go somewhere else. And that is a major gain from a social anti-fragility perspective. And really, the lack of guarantees here, the lack of sort of like, uh, you know, people feeling like they're entitled to something is a great thing because that makes the community more meritocratic, right? Bitcoin is a meritocracy. It doesn't care if you have degrees from Harvard or Yale or Oxford or whatever. It does not care if you happen to run a business that raised $200 million. They don't care. It's all about the merit, right? It's about what you can do for the community and what you are providing for the network, what you are doing to make the network more secure. And that is what creates that social anti-fragility, right? Like it, it, makes, it, 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 uh, it makes the whole thing go, uh, get stronger every time there's a disordering event. And if, you th and if we think about the organic part of the social anti-fragility, the answer is really easy. It's about the community. See, uh, Emin Gun Sire uh, famously wrote that selfish mining paper a few years ago. And he said, hey, you know what? I broke Bitcoin. Here is how uh, a miner can, you know, just mine selfishly and they will, uh, you know, buy, you know, completely be able to take all the reward. And, you know, um, it's technologically feasible. It's economically rational. Um, and, you know, therefore, I've proven that Bitcoin is broken. And I've asked myself, well, why? Okay, he, he's kind of right, right? Like the selfish mining attack does work from a technological perspective and it is economically rational. So why hasn't anyone done it? Well, it turns out it's the social community. See, if anyone tried a selfish mining attack, guess what would happen? The entire community would, would destroy that miner that was trying it. There would be there would be like uh, a lot of other miners that would be like okay we're cutting them off I don't care what blocks they 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 make we're not following that rule and and, and uh, you know if they if they try that we're gonna stop working in some other rule. Social community is very very strong in Bitcoin and they they weed out sort of like bad behavior as a result because it is it is a meritocracy it is all about what you're doing for bitcoin and every every actor in the bitcoin e ecosystem has to sort of behave well or else they will get cut off by the community and as the new york agreement showed when you get cut off by the community it is going to be painful and people are going to punish you in ways that you have not thought of outside of sort of the normal technological and economic ways they're going to, you know, you're, you're, you take on serious reputational risk if you, if you sort of go against the will of the community. And that is a good thing. It, it keeps people in line. There's, it, it's, it's funny because uh, Bitcoin is an adversarial network. But because it's an adversarial network, this community has, has come, uh, you know, come up that sort of enforces, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, a good behavior on all of the actors in a way. And, you know, like we, we can talk about like all the possible technological and economic attacks, but the social attacks are the scariest for any actor in this community. I mean, there are some people that don't care, namely hackers and malware developers and people like that. Uh, but in many ways, they're not really a part of that part of the community. They're just utilizing Bitcoin and saying, hey, you know what, we're uh, we're going to use it because it happens to be convenient. They would use cash, too, if that were convenient. But yeah, that that is the social anti-fragility of Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about the technological anti-fragility, which is really held together by the developers, the economic anti-fragility, which is held together by the holders and the anti-vigility, which is, you know, held together by the community. 
And, uh, and this is uh, the theme that I want to get to is that there aren't really any guarantees in Bitcoin, right? The guarantees are kind of removed. And that's really at the source of a lot of the anti-fragility that we have. Uh, when you have a, a safety net, a, a bat, you know, uh, somebody that can sort of bail you out, that's when you get more fragile. When you have no guarantees in, in many of these things like Bitcoin does, that's when you get anti-fragile. Well, that's when, uh, you know, disordering events strengthen you. And really, uh, this is uh, in a weird way about virtue, because when you have all of these things that, uh, that make you stronger, uh, it makes you uh, makes you more virtuous as a community. Uh, you know, we, you have better behaving actors, people and businesses that are more incentivized to do the right thing because they don't have bailouts, right? They don't, they, they don't have all of these uh, ways in which they can sort of rent seek or abuse power. It, that's the beauty of a decentralized network. And ultimately that makes us stronger. And, and really, um, I, I talk about all of these as a way to sort of encourage all of you because you are all part of this social community. If you're watching this on my live stream or if you are there in rally, uh, you know, you, you are part of this community that sort of enforces good behavior, part of the security that we have, believe it or not. And really, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of disordering events to come. I mean, eventually some government's going to ban Bitcoin. Eventually, some you know, there's going to be sort of more a uh, stronger technological protocol level attacks, and you know, there there are going to be uh, you know economic actors maybe at the state level that are going to try to disrupt Bitcoin in some serious way. Okay, because in a way, all of those things ultimately end up strengthening Bitcoin, and that's ultimately my message. Thank you very much. All right, very well put. Uh, I'm sure we've got a number of questions, though. Let me let me start off with one for you, uh, Jimmy. Uh, throw you a bit of a curveball here. You you mentioned the community a number of times, and I think we've seen you know so much strife and vitriol within the quote unquote community. Like, how would you define you know, what is the community? How do we know what the community wants? Uh, how do we how do we determine you know, which virtues that are being espoused by one segment of the community is the community? Or you know, should we revert back to like traditional democratic principles and try to do some sort of voting to figure this out? Just uh, give, me, give me your thoughts on this abstract concept of the community. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, the, the nice thing about Bitcoin is that you don't need to hold any votes. You just need some sort of future or market and uh, the economics will tell you everything you need to know. And, and that's the thing to me in the sense that you don't, you don't need to hold like a, a vote or anything. Uh, you know, the information is uh, almost always priced in right away because the incentives are so aligned and, and people can just vote with their wallet if they will. And, and in many ways, that's the most honest vote there is, is the one that you make with your wallet. Uh, so. You know, I, there is vitriol, there's a lot of fighting, but, you know, in a way that's good too, because uh, the more we fight and, you know, debate this stuff and, uh, you know, a lot of the people that obviously were fighting have now gone over to Bitcoin Cash and they have their own community and their own things that they're trying out. And that's good too, uh, because, you know, they experiment, they'll learn some things. Uh, we, I, 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 I'm not so arrogant as to think there's nothing to learn from altcoins as, as a Bitcoin community. There's a, of course there are things to learn and, uh, and, you know, observing them and figuring out what they're doing and how, you know, more, more likely the mistakes they're making and how we can prevent mistakes on of that nature in the Bitcoin community. That's a good thing. Um, so in many ways, uh, you know, there, there are, uh, ways in which, uh, you know, the community can respond, like through economics, but there, you know, there are also ways in which, you know, you can find out through social media or whatever. I mean, like that's always like kind of noisy and it's hard to figure out signal from noise, but case, but price, price to me is, uh, is, is really the big signal. Cool. All right. Uh, if you've got questions, just raise your hand. I'll bring the mic to you. 
All right, first question. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. That was a great talk. Towards the end of the talk, in this, I think the social media part, you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that or that Bitcoin is a meritocracy, and it really boils down to what what do you bring to the community? So I'm trying to mm -hmm. think of examples. What would an example or some examples be of contributing to the community? Uh, it, from a social sense, uh, definitely sort of, uh, you know, I, the, the best thing you can do as a Bitcoin holder is to hold, you know, that, that, that's going to, uh, you know, that, that gives Bitcoin value, right? The more, the more of a network effect we have, the, the stronger it grows. Um, socially speaking, just being plugged in and knowing what's going on, having an opinion, um, you know, uh, one of the hardest things to do in a democracy is to get people to care. You know, half the people don't even vote in this country, partly because there's no economic incentive oftentimes to do it, to like inform yourself of a lot of the things. And, you know, I mean, I, I and, and I count myself among them. I don't I, I don't pay attention to the news because I don't find it, you know, very interesting or useful or relevant to my life. Uh, with Bitcoin, though, you know, a lot of this thing, these things are relevant. Uh, if you if you have a hard fork coming, which we're going to get many of them in the in the next year. Well, that's that actually directly impacts your wallet. So, um, you know, being informed of that, being able to tell people about that and, you know, getting bringing in more holders, obviously strengthening the community that way. Those are all things that you guys probably already are doing. Uh, but doing more of it is going to help. Uh, Bitcoin in, in in the very social anti fragile way. Jimmy, you mentioned. Um, I don't know which side goes up. Uh, Jimmy, you mentioned uh, Jamie Diamond earlier in your presentation. I was wondering if you uh, had seen any economists like uh, Joseph Stiglitz uh, talking about uh, Bitcoin because he's he seems to be very much anti Bitcoin. And um, do you have any responses to economists? <laughs> um, I, I don't. I mean, I, I think they're just wrong. Um, and, you know, uh, many of these guys are on the older side. They have a lot of pride. They put a lot of their careers into a particular perspective. And the crazy thing about Bitcoin is it's proving all of them wrong. Uh, it's saying, OK, well, you know, maybe maybe you know, you can create money out of nothing, uh, you know, out of just code, and it doesn't have to have a physical usage or something like that. Um, and, you know, uh, many of them just are too old, too set in their ways to to change their mind about it. And oftentimes, like, uh, it's kind of sad, but a lot of scientific and technological progress happens when a lot of these old geezers die. And they, they you know, they allowed the younger people to say, okay, you know what, I think they were wrong on this. Uh, now we can just sort of quietly shove their thoughts under the rug and you know go with go with this stuff. I, I feel the same way with a lot of these economists. They they don't know what they're talking about, uh, or they've been proven wrong by Bitcoin, and they sort of have to attack it to uh, preserve their professional credibility. Yeah, I think there's definitely a saying in academia about that regarding the the generational changing of the guards. All right. Mm. Um, hey, Jimmy, thanks. I listen to you and Tone every day. Um, about the uh, anti-fragility of hard forks, I think um, a lot of people are on board with kind of there's like no such thing as bad news in Bitcoin because it just brings people in and makes skeptics into holders. But I think people like and me included are kind of like a little more skeptical about whether a hard fork is really a kind of anti-fragile event. Could, could you talk a little more about why you see that as anti-fragile as well? Yeah, sure. So, um, like, let's go back to August first, the very first uh, hard fork, and that that was uh, Bitcoin Cash. Obviously, like the whole network was more or less shut down for like two days. Nobody was transacting. None of the exchanges were open. None of the merchants were processing payments because they didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, but in a way, that was really good because uh, pretty much everyone had to handle this hard fork case. Every wallet had to figure out how to how to immunize against future hard forks. Um, and now there's like a, basically a replay, replay protection standard. You you have a you know a sig hash fork ID and you shift it by however many bytes and that's that's your hard fork and that that makes sure that your transactions are not good on the other fork and stuff like that. And Bitcoin Bitcoin Gold basically used that and 
forks coming up, they're they're using it too. So in a way, you know, there there's a bigger toolbox for people to dip into. Um, that said, you know, obviously, you know, the developers at Trezor, I'm sure, would much more uh, like to work on cooler things like Schnorr signatures or something like that than like handle the latest hard fork. But that said, you know, there 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 is an anti fragility here in the sense that the tech is is getting more immune to uh, all of these other hard forks that are happening and that's a good thing right like uh that that makes everybody uh uh you know all, all of the software better um and you know like you're if you're if you are sort of handling for one hard fork as a programmer you're you're going to be like okay well you know i don't want to deal with this again so let's just abstract this and make it like super easy to handle a hard sense that you have to change or add or whatever whenever a new hard fork comes in i mean that's that's the world we're going to look at next year is they're go there's going to be a hard fork and pretty much like the next day, everybody, uh, as long as the spec is published, all, all of these wallets are going to support it and say, okay, you can get rid of it right now. There's going to be an exchange that's going to have a wa wallet integrated. Go sell my hard fork coins for Bitcoin right now. And Come back. <laughs> Hello? There we I think we lost you for a second, but we've got you back. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. How much did, of that did you catch? Uh, the exchanges are all going to support insta-dumping of shitcoins. <laughs> yes, yes. That's probably going to be an awesome app. <laughs> uh, all right, here, we got another one. Yes, sir. Hey, Jimmy, I've uh, been following along on your Bitcoin tech talk. Um, can you go a little bit into more detail about what you're trying to do to educate developers about some of the upcoming technological solutions and to get them plugged into the ecosystem? You talked a little bit about social media mm -hmm. and economic and how to find that true signal mm -hmm. in the noise on social media. There's a lot of like, hey, we hit this price, but there's not a lot talking about, like you said, sure signatures and things like that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure, sure. So uh, from a Bitcoin education perspective, um, I, I, I started Bitcoin Tech Talk uh, in, in part to have a place to just sort of explain stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I've gotten some core developers to write for it. And, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, a wonderful article on Mass by David Harding, some like 0.15 features by John Newberry. Um, and you know, I, I wanted a place for people to go to do that. So that that's one uh, sort of initiative I've taken. Another one is uh, you know my show. I had Paul Stork on there. I, I can't pronounce his name. Uh, I had him on there yesterday talking about drive chains and all the all the different there. Uh, we talked. Uh, I, I mean, and you know, I, I have my programming blockchain seminar, which uh, is coming to your area. Um, I'm coming uh, to Charlotte, I think, uh, January 16th and 17th. So that, that should be pretty exciting. But that's that's basically uh, training developers uh, to become Bitcoin developers, right? That That's that's another major thing. Um, I may also be writing a book, um, you know, so that that's uh, something I'm still in negotiations uh, with O'Reilly about. Um, but, you know, that uh, all of those things are sort of geared towards uh, educating uh, developers mostly, though, you know, obviously non-developers can, uh, you know, learn from them too. Uh, but as far as uh, social media separating signal from noise, it, it is very difficult because oftentimes the facts are intertwined with opinion and, uh, and that makes things very difficult to parse. Uh, if somebody very smart that knows a lot about the technical stuff um, sort of slants it with their opinion, it's very difficult to know how much of it is you know, them spinning it a certain way and how much of it is just like actually there. And uh, and that that tends to be a very big challenge. I, I, I would just encourage everyone to at least know a little bit about coding and the technological stuff involved. Um, I, I promise it's not quite as hard as everyone makes it out to be. People tend to think, okay, this is technical. It's, a, it's like some magic black box, or, or at least uh, that's how the people that I talk to <laughs> that aren't technical seem to see it. Uh, but you know, I, I mean, get yourself educated, learn about it, um, and obviously we need a lot more, you know, good technical writers in this space that can explain it way better than I can, and just sort of like bring a lot of these features to sort of uh, you know a general audience. So hopefully, um, you know, that that tends to develop as uh, as we grow as an ecosystem. 
Hi, Jim. First, I, I wanted to say I really uh, appreciated your uh, a lot of your recent posts on Medium, including your one uh, a few days ago about Fortitude. I thought that was a very good read. Um, I wanted to ask you, because I've dealt with my fair share of altcoins and shitcoins in my day, and I wanted to ask you um, about the differences between uh, proof of work and proof of stake, and if you believe that uh, proof of stake somehow, does that change the anti-fragility of Bitcoin or is it just uh, a different means to an end? Yeah, um, there's a there's a really good post by Paul Stork, uh, Truthcoin, uh, where he says, he says, you know, proof of work is actually the cheapest thing because if you make it proof of stake, it ends up actually kind of being like proof of work just in a very obscure way, um, you know, in an unclear way, whereas proof of work is just, pretty straightforward. Um, and, and I think that's right. Like uh, a lot of these other proof of X schemes, um, they're trying to solve for a problem, uh, but they just move it somewhere else. You can't, you can't really defeat the laws of economics in this regard is that, you, you know, like, you know, if, if, if you have some, uh, something that can be influenced by human action, um, then that thing uh, to to gain more money, well, that that thing's going to be done at whatever cost it is, and it's eventually going going to find the same e equilibrium in terms of cost relative to the entire economy of whatever coin. Um, I I don't know how much it changes the anti fragility per se, uh, but I am open to you know things being experimented on. Let's try a proof of stake coin. There are several. Um, how have they done? Not very well so far. Um, and, you know, I mean, I know Ethereum has been talking about it forever, um, but I'd kind of like to see it move to proof of stake just to see what happens. I want to I want to I, I want more data. I want more people to have knowledge about this stuff and make smarter, wiser, more prudent decisions as a result. Hey, Jimmy, so out of all the scaling and second layer technologies out there, what which, which one are you? most excited about personally and which ones do you think are most realistic to happen in the near future well it depends on how you uh define near future um you know i mean things take long in bitcoin for a reason largely because we're we're not going to like just suddenly go do stuff that's not the type of community we are if you want to do that you go to ethereum or something um and you know yeah you suffer the consequences of doing that obviously um as far as um uh, you know uh, what yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of different ones. I, I would say um, the one that I'm most excited about is probably drive chains. And I, I just said, you know, like, you know, the, don't think we're going to do X, Y, or Z really quick. But th this is the sort of tech that if it comes along, then it will have sort of faster innovation cycles because you can try a new drive chain. And then, you know, like if it doesn't work, just sort of like abandon it by bringing all the money back into the main chain and then go do another one. Um, and, you know, that it, it sort of allows for a lot more experimentation and in sort of trying different things. You can think of, uh, you know, you, you can have, you know, different implementations of things and, you know, people can feel free to try different things. And that that to me is very exciting from an innovation perspective. Uh, thanks for the talk, Jimmy. Uh, really nice uh, techno, I guess, socioeconomic uh, analysis. Uh, what I had, uh, I've been wondering this for like, I guess, the past year and a half. Um, would you compare this, like, this organic phenomena to more like, uh, like the internet? You have it's this exchange of, I guess, back in the dot com era, you had exchange of information, right? And mm -hmm. it is fundamentally a network based technology. And the same thing kind of sort of applies for this type of. Bitcoin and other blockchain uh, technology from the technical side, right? Mm. <clears throat> Do you kind of see this emerging as a parallel economy of sorts, um, where you know it's laying the framework for uh, more of a non-government backed economy that's sort of just organic and and and, and fueled by the greater good uh, within people, and so it's sort of like an internet of humanity if you want to analyze it and, and uh, you know raise an analog um, to the internet of things that most people talk about today. Oh, yeah. do, do you have any thoughts on that idea? Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I'll, I'll steal Antonopoulos's line. This is the internet of money. And I, I think you're exactly right. This is already sort of like 
its own economy in a way. It's it's decentralized. There's no like, you know, person that gets to say it's going to be this way or that way. Uh, and, and it's it's a very interesting experiment in that uh, you know we're we're sort of living through it right now. Um, one of, one of the big differences between Bitcoin and all the other altcoins is that. All the other altcoins have a centralized development team. They, they, uh, you know, like one person, most usually the person that created the coin gets to say and do whatever the hell, the hell they want. You know, if, if you want to roll back this transaction, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll put in that hard fork. If, if you can convince them to do it, that's essentially what they do. And that that's the special thing about Bitcoin. Um, one of the greatest gifts that Satoshi left us with is disappearing. In a way, if he had stuck around, he, she, they, whatever, um, you know, like it, it, that person, Satoshi, would have had a lot of influence, uh, probably outsized influence on this uh, whole socioeconomic experiment. Um, and, you know, we, we are seeing sort of a, a whole sort of sub economy. And this is one of the cool things about hard forks that I mentioned in an article I wrote, which is that. We get to do sort of economic experiments, and this is like the closest to a scientific uh, experiment on an economic scale um, that we can do is that, okay, with Bitcoin Cash, we, we can see how velocity of money sort of affects that economy. With, uh, with Bitcoin, we get to see how having stronger security properties affects that economy. You know, like these things, these are questions that economists have debated for years. We get to actually see some results and uh you know over a longer period of time and you know that that's a wonderful thing and it, it, it is a network it is sort of separate from the normal real world economy if you will uh but in a way it's it's a very good thing we get to learn a lot more and we add to human knowledge this way yeah i, mean, I would actually add a little bit to that just to make a note of you know we're still in this bootstrapping phase where a lot of people they still use their their local uh, government issued fiat currency as their unit of account, and they're using some on ramps and off ramps to jump into crypto assets and out of crypto assets. But you know the the game I think will really change when people's mindset changes, and once they're in the system, they can do everything and more uh, inside of the system than they can do outside of the system. Uh, I think that's what really might create a, you know, quote unquote, parallel or disjoint economy that goes off on its own and, and starts to evolve differently from the rest of the world. Hmm. Anyone else? All right, here we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, should I press? Something? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're good. Uh, thank you, Jim, for your talk. I enjoyed it very much. So, um, I'd like to um, know your opinion on that. Uh, C we know the CME and the CBOE are going to list uh, Bitcoin futures in the near future. So, what's your thoughts on that? On that, thank you. Sure. Um, I, I actually don't know that much about how futures affect things. I mean, I, I think Jameson wrote that uh, wonderful article a while ago. Nobody understands Bitcoin, and that's okay. Uh, this is one of the parts I don't really understand, and I'm not, I, I don't really pretend to. Uh, I mean, I can, I guess, analyze some of the incentives maybe if I understood it a little better. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't really feel like I have uh, the right even to a decent opinion because I, I just don't know that much about it. I heard it's going to let the institution short Bitcoin into the ground and kill it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Everybody who shorted Bitcoin so far has gotten wrecked, but mm. maybe that will change. All right. Every, everyone's curiosity sated? Not yet. Um, yeah, I was just I was just thinking about Nassim Taleb and his book and the classic anti-fragile theory, and I was wondering, this ability for Bitcoin to kind of bring down the people kind of go against the grain that you were talking about like I won't name names but we all kind of know the people who have kind of like fallen from from grace and bitcoin um is that do you think Nassim Taleb would agree that that's a property of anti-fragile systems yeah absolutely I mean nobody nobody's entitled to you know any position for life um and I I think it's a good thing that you know developers and companies and uh, you know, people. Uh, you know, even economic holders or social leaders—they've like shuffled in and out. Like, um, and you know, they, it, 
you know, once once you're sort of not contributing to the community in a particular way, I, 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 the the fact that the system kicked them out is is a good thing. I, if you think of uh, the Bitcoin community as sort of like a body, and you know, there's like a dead cell or something, you know, the body sort of expels it. Um, that is an anti-fragile thing, uh, and I, I definitely think that would be something Nasib Taleb would agree with. Cool. So, uh, Jimmy, is your uh, developer session in Charlotte already booked up? Is it too late for people to get in on that? No, no, no. Uh, there's room, and uh, you know, I, I am offering a twenty percent discount if you uh, have a, any contribution to Bitcoin BTCD, Bitcoin J, or uh, Bitcoin or Armory or Electrum. I mean, basically, if you have any open source contribution to any of these open source libraries that are Bitcoin related. Send it to me, I'll probably give you a 20% discount. Alternatively, you could just pay full price and then afterwards contribute to one of those and I'll just refund you the 20%. So that that's the offer that I am giving to all of you. Cool, yeah, send me the information and then I'll uh, disseminate that amongst the group. Yeah. Uh, I think that everyone is sufficiently uh, happy here. So mm -hmm. one last round of applause, please, for Jimmy. As always, Jimmy, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time and your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Good night.